Are you willing to reclaim the divine in all things? Channel Paul Selig joins us to share the profound teachings of the guides, shedding light on how our consciousness shapes the world as we experience it, and how reclaiming our divine self and the divinity in all things holds the key to humanity's transformation. Next, on Exploring the Mystical Side of Life. Stay tuned. Welcome to Exploring the Mystical Side of Life with your host, Linda Lang. Hi, this is Linda Lang from ThoughtChange.com. We are exploring the mystical side of life once again this week. If you enjoy our conversations, remember to subscribe, share with a friend. Today, we have best-selling author and channel for the guides, Paul Salag, back with us. Paul has a new book out called Innocence, and we are going to dive right in. Welcome back, Paul. Thanks for having me. Well, this series that you are in the midst of, this Innocence book, is the second book of the Manifestation Trilogy. These two books are really beautiful, beautiful books. They are probably in my top five books. You know, I don't write the books. I'm a channel. So the books are dictated. I mean, they're spoken and then transcribed. They're unedited transcriptions of of the channeling sessions. You do use a couple of terms that some people might not be familiar with. So could you tell us what the upper room is? The upper room, the guides say, is the octave above what we know of as the common field or our common reality. They say everything exists in octaves, in tone and vibration. And the upper room is simply the octave above the one that we're, we know ourselves through. It exists concurrently with the one that we know. It's always here. And you can understand it sort of simply, I suppose, as, as Christ consciousness, although they don't use that in a religious sense. They say, you know, the upper room is the highest you can hold or maintain while still having a body, it's the highest level of alignment that you can come to. And that's where they're teaching us from. The other term that people might not be familiar with is the monad. Can you explain that one? It's the God within. That's in one way to look at it. You can call it the, the Christ principle. You can call it the divine self. It's the, the singular aspect that is also of the whole. So it's the small piece that's of the big piece and knows itself in both ways. I have picked up a little points in here that I wanted to touch base with you. The first quote from the book that says, the effect of the manifestation of these claims must be evidential in the lives lived by each of you. So now we're talking about the declarations and them actually making shifts in people's lives. You've been working with this longer than anybody else because it's coming through you. I'm going to assume that you also have worked with the declarations. Am I correct? Yes, but perhaps not in the same way that a student of the work. I mean, I am a student of the work. I'm not a spiritual teacher. I'm not a guru. You know, I'm a conscious channel, but when this stuff is coming through me, I'm somewhat removed. I'm really uh, like a stenographer or a radio carrying a broadcast. So I retain maybe a third of what actually comes through me in a, in a lecture. And um, I do work with the teachings. But, you know, the hard part for me is that the teachings are coming through me and who the heck am I? So I have a somewhat different relationship with the work. But yeah, the guides have said, and they've said it again and again and again, this stuff is provable. What I do know, because I began doing this work when I was in my early 30s, you know, I suppose is when I first started hearing and working with the energy. The energy has always been incredibly palpable. It's a physical thing that can be experienced. And that's part of the reason I continued to do the work was I was so fascinated by the experience of it. And it's provable. So if you're in a room full of people and you work with the claims of truth, everybody feels the energy, you know, almost always, you know, and where they say it's going to be coming. And the affect of the energies 
or working with these things on my life has been profound. There's no question about it. I will agree with you that the energy is very palpable. You can just feel it. And I know for myself, especially if there are a lot of declarations, I can only read a few pages at a time because it's like my unconscious or my energy field is busy adjusting. The guides have said this since the very beginning. You know, the books are energetic experiences that work directly with the reader. And, you know, they say these are books that are experienced more than read, the intellectual information. The information on the page is really for the intellect, so you have some context for what's actually transpiring at an energetic level. But they're saying these are books that are journeys. They, they take you someplace where you were not when you first started the book. And, um, and I like that about them. I like that too, actually. In these two books, you've actually done some toning when you gave the messages live. Obviously, there's no toning in the pages of the book, but can one assume that that vibration is encoded in the words? Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. In the audiobooks, I do tone for the audiobooks, and it's there, and I and that's been the case for the last few books, and. I've heard stories of people who've been, you know, driving their car, listening to the audio, but going to have to pull over to the side of the road once the toning starts. But I expect that it's there in the text. It just says in the text, you know, the guides tone through Paul in parentheses, almost like a stage direction. Um, but it's present. You know, the whole book is a transmission. So this is part of a transmission. You don't have to be in the room to receive it because the guides are as they explain that they're working with the reader as they read. And do you have to start at the beginning? I don't think it's going to hurt you. I think the very first book, which was dictated through me in 2009 and published in 2010, is in some ways the basis for what is followed and perhaps holds the DNA of, of the following books. Um, but, you know, Resurrection, which is the first book of this trilogy, is a is a very good way in. And the guides have said this for years. They say that they teach in a one room schoolhouse and that they meet every student wherever they are. And in every book thus far, they've found a way somehow to sort of catch everybody up, you know, to give them the basic comprehension, understanding of, of what's to come in a foundational way. What I believe, though, is that the attunements which are energetic, escalate as you go through the texts. And so I think people have an easier time somehow, you know, when they've been brought through a series of, of, of attunements, then just sort of get them all at once. But you know what, the guides, when they, when they lecture now, and there's often many, many, many hundreds of new people in a lecture when they're doing this stuff live, they'll take everybody through the attunements, you know, in sequence, all the way up to where they are now, and it's there, it's happening. I've always said, go where you're drawn, go where you're led with the books. You know, if you're led to the, go to this book first, it's going to be the perfect book for you to go to. Pretty profound work, really. Well, again, it's their work, you know. I'm the guy in the chair for this more than anything else, yeah. You started this because of a spiritual experience. Yeah, a series of them. I mean, it was a period of waking up. It was 1987. I was 25. I was a year out of graduate school, if, if that, even a year. And um, I heard a voice telling me to get my act together, which came after I'd started praying for the first time in my life. And I listened to it, and my life began to change, and things began to happen. And some of the changes were radical, and I was opening up psychically, you know, at that period without really understanding what was happening. So that was the beginning of a whole really kind of crazy experience or path that I've been on since. It was not what I expected to be doing. This is not what I thought I would be doing with my life. Um, I'm grateful for what I do, but I didn't have it planned out. You know, I had a whole other idea for myself. And really for 25 years, I was teaching college and working in academia, teaching at NYU when I was running a graduate program at Goddard College. Um, while I was doing this channeled work, quietly and then beginning a practice as a psychic. And once the book started coming, which wasn't until later, till I was, you know, in my late 40s, 48, 50, I think was when the book started. 
that I had to let go of that life and just allow this to become the work that I do. Do you know exactly who the guides are? Yeah, they, I mean, they, they're teachers. Um, they've said teachers, missionaries. They've used the term ascended masters. It was in the first book, and it's not a term that I love, so I don't hear it from them much anymore. But the name that they've given when they've been asked or when they've announced themselves is Melchizedek, which is a priesthood, and it's an old name, and it's an old lineage. But I just think of them as the guides. You know, there's one that I've seen. He appears the same way when I've seen him and I trust him and I trust that energy. And, you know, they're called the guides because my ex from many years ago, when he found out that I could do this, he used to say, ask the guides this, ask the guides that. So suddenly they were called the guides and they haven't objected and it's an easy name, you know, to work with. My experience in spiritual communities is that there can be some egoic attachment to names you know, and lineage and all these things. And I, I, my feeling at this point is truth is truth. It helps to know who you're talking to, yes. But, you know, anybody can call themselves anything as far as I'm concerned. And it really has more to do with the truth and the, the, the love that is implicit in the teachings. So that's what I go with. I think you can tell by the vibration, really. Yeah, I agree. That wisdom of tuning in and, and uh, feeling the vibration. Also in the Book of Innocence, there's a quote that says, you need to allow the truth of your expression made manifest as you to support the awakening of the aspects of self that require the love, the light, and knowledge of their true nature. Any aspect of self that is being denied will and must be brought to the light to be reseen. And I have goosebumps reading that. This sounds an awful lot like shadow work. Yeah, I mean, that's not my background. I suppose I've done it or do it. This isn't a book that uh, you get to sort of say, well, I don't want to think about that anymore, so let's just make it go away. And this is a book of facing your crap. The whole path is about really sort of moving through what's been denied. In one of the books, I think it's the book, I think it's the book of, Al I think it's Alchemy, which was in the last series. I was going through a whole lot of stuff, including probably my Saturn return or something when that was being, you know, delivered. But there's a claim in that book and it's, I have come, I have come, I have come. And it's the divine self announcing itself in presence. Um, and that comes once they bring you to what they call the upper room. And they say what happens then is that you move into a process of reclaiming the aspects of self that have been held in darkness, held in shadow. Because the guides say, you know, who you put in shadow, what you put in darkness, calls you to that darkness. And that's just energetic accord. It's not through force of will. What you resist persists, I guess, as others might say. And my experience has been, yeah, you get to encounter all this stuff you know, when you do the work and it's productive, it's not fun, but there is a sense, and I do feel this finally, really, that it's all for good, like it or not, you know, not what I would have chosen, but... But apparently what you've chosen... At a higher level or at a soul level, yes, but it's just, I don't think this work is like the get out of jail free card. I do think that there's, there's something for us to learn. We get to learn it. That's part of what we came for, it's my opinion. It's not just talking about your own aspects that you don't want to acknowledge, right? It, it's talking about what you see in the world, too. Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the apt criticisms of what some people call the new age is that it's very self-indulgent and reflective. And it's about what am I going to get? What am I going to manifest? Where's my spiritual growth? You know, it's a lot of that stuff. And when people ask the guides about manifestation, sometimes they'll explain that everything that we see or experience beyond our idea of personal world, we're in energetic accordance with. They say accord, A-C-C-O-R-D or A-C-H-O-R-D is on a piano, which is vibration. And they talk about collective agreements. So we live in a world, they say, where everything was named by those who came before us. And the values that we give anything are what we've been in most ways indoctrinated into giving. This is more expensive. It must be better. That's what beauty is. That's what one should aspire to. That's what a male is or a female is. And we have this very 
polarized way of, of understanding our experience, which is mostly our own creation. So, you know, what the guide said to me early on with this teaching, when I first started to come through, and this was years ago, they said, you know, you didn't create the war in the Middle East. However, you're in accord with it because it's part of your experience and the consciousness that you hold is contributing to it in one way or another, because everything in one way or another is indeed malleable to thought, you know, and that's the energy we bring to something. And that goes back to this very simple teaching. You know, what you bless blesses you in return. What you damn damns you back, which is again, vibrational accord. Now what a blessing is, they say, is the realization, which is knowing, the true knowing of the inherent divine where it appears to have been denied or lacked, you know, not, not present. You bring God back to where it was. And I don't mean God in any kind of religious sense, but the consciousness that is source can alter what it encounters, which is the act of prayer. I think one of the major messages of both this book and the book before resurrection is that everything is God, whether or not we approve of it. Yep, yep, yep. That's a hard one. Yeah. So it's not comfortable. Well, or source, you know, because people say God and it should be this idea of God, but the guides have said, you know, there is one note sung in the universe that is in manifestation is all things. And that one note sung is source or expression of source. The guides have said the word, which is a, a, a word that they use. The word is the energy of the creator in action. And the reclaiming of all things is what it has been seems to be a great deal of their work. They say you really can't make anything holy. It already is. But you can deny the inherent divine in anything. And the stuff that we point fingers at and say, how can that be a God is basically what we've chosen to hold in darkness and then replicate that way. You know, somebody who's been raised in a dark cellar only knows that and creates at that level. And you can punish and damn and crucify that person if you want to, or you can bring the light to that person or to that situation or to that idea and transform it. So it's really more about transformation than fixing, in my opinion. And that's how they've been teaching this for a while. And it's challenging because there are many things in this world that maybe aren't what you would choose consciously, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I was uh, channeling in Calgary, Alberta years ago for a weekend workshop. And I was a Saturday workshop. And then I woke up Sunday morning. And I turned on the computer and I had to go channel in about an hour. You know, I didn't have time for, for my coffee. And I saw the news of the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando. And I went, oh, my God, how am I going to do this thing? You know, at the time, it was the biggest mass shooting in the U.S. And, you know, the guides showed up and delivered a whole lecture on it about how to, uh, I think it was called How to Deal with it. I mean, we, we gave it the title. They don't give things titles except for the books or the chapter titles. But I think it's called like How to Deal with an Atrocity. But it's all about reclamation reclaiming the divine where it's been most denied. And, you know, we live in a world where people say, you know, that something terrible happens, but it says, oh, well, prayers and blessings, as if that's a platitude. And I get angry at that because it's, you know, do something, do something to change the circumstances that keep compelling these things to happen at whatever level. But also, you know, I think real prayer is realization. It's just the realization of the inherent divine, which can change things. If it can't change things and it's a bunch of bull, then don't bother with it. Better to go do something practical than to pray if you don't believe it, it can make a difference. I find it very interesting that the name of this trilogy is the Manifestation Trilogy, particularly because you just mentioned how self-serving in the spiritual or New Age communities manifestation teachings can be. I've had confusion about this for a long time. And what the guides used to say is, there's nothing wrong with a house on the hill. Somebody gets to live there, but why do you want it? So if you want to be the envy of your neighbors, you're creating in fear. And the action of fear, they say, is to claim more fear. But if it's what you need and, and what's going to give you the most joy, there's nothing wrong with having it. Somebody gets to have it. 
the big question that they ask when it comes to this is the idea of who's claiming this, what aspect of the self is claiming this. Now, the personality self, and call it the small self, there's nothing wrong with it, you know, has its proclivities, predilections, desires, all those things. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the true self, which is the divine self, they say the true self knows and the small self thinks. And the true self knows itself beyond history or what we think should be or what we should have or what we should aspire to, which is all basically historical data. Because the small self only knows itself through history, whereas the true self or the divine self knows itself beyond that. So when we get out of the way and we start moving into reception, and that's their claim, God is, God is, God is, you know, it's everything, then you can become a conduit. You begin to flow with that energy and stop telling God what it's supposed to do and it's supposed to be. Um, and, you know, I don't think that there's anything wrong if you have three kids, you need to buy a house. There's nothing wrong with saying, well, I need at least four bedrooms in this house or three, but whatever you, your family of four would need or five would need. Nothing wrong with being practical. You know, I mean, it's like if I live in a cold place and I have a wood burning stove, you know, I don't think I should just expect the firewood to show up because I need it. But I do think that I probably would hope that I would know, learn how to use an ax and cut a tree down if I need to keep myself warm for the winter and do my part in this. But I think knowing what you want isn't that, but also opening to what might be beyond that is far, far greater. I, I'm living a life now that truthfully, I don't think I could have known I could have had even 10 years ago, five years ago, even really. And I'm still surprised by that because my idea of who I was supposed to be and how things were supposed to look was very different and far less lovely than what it turned out to be. And I'm so grateful for that because I don't know how it happened some days, except I just kept showing up and saying yes. And when the actions were required of me to go, okay, maybe, maybe this can be so. The guides say nothing can be claimed until it's first a possibility. We're not going to claim anything that we don't believe is possible. And it's like you go to the store, well, it's possible. When you see it on the shelf, well, you can I have it? Then you have to know that you can have it. Then you have to take it off the shelf. You have to do your part to be in reception to it. You can't just walk by and say, well, somebody else gets to have that. That's how I understand this now. Maybe all you needed to do was just say yes. It's a big part of it. It really is. But, you know, again, we only say yes to what we think we can have because that's how reality is set up. I mean, the guides I work with say, we're always getting what we expect. Always, like it or not. So this series that you're in the midst of, it's not talking about manifestation like that, like how to get the house on the hill, per se. It's talking about manifestation as reality, physical form, everything in form, including the things that we have a say in and what we get to choose. So I don't think that they're disregarding that, but this is not the teaching of how to get a better looking boyfriend or how to, um, you know, invest your money wisely. Other people do that stuff and they do a very good job. This is just a different teaching. You know, and they continue to unpack this because people always ask about the manifestation piece and do I outline everything and do I sit and look at a board all day long and say, come to me, come to me. And th that's not really how they teach, but they say you go to the upper room and you become receptive. You go to, you go to a level of receptivity. And they also say, you know, we're all busy, so busy trying to, to know source that we forget that source already knows us. You know, and then we can move into an agreement with a higher mind that might know more than we think. There is another interesting line in the book. It said the divine self does not hold the record that you do for your indiscretions. It does not care if you cheated or, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like not keeping score. I don't remember that at all, but I don't remember much, honestly. Um, it's only when I sit down to do the audio books. And I have to read the book aloud, you know, from start to finish that I, I get to understand it. So, yeah, I guess that's true if that's what they said. I mean, I do hear and have heard from them that we're accountable to all of our actions. We're responsible for what we do. And I believe the effect of those actions, too. 
you know, they say, you know, the action of fear is to claim more fear and every choice you make in fear gets you more of the same. But they also say that sets a trajectory. And the same is true for love. Any action in love will hold that, that sort of the DNA or the energy of love will go forth through that choice, which I think is quite lovely. And you can change your trajectory by changing your motivation. That's very well. We have that. In the book, Paul, the guides say, there could not be a God who would allow pain or a choice to deceive the self and claim God as a source of pain. God as the one note sung or the source of all things is not the executor of pain. It does not support suffering, but it does allow choice. And until humanity's choice moves beyond separation, humanity will be challenged. Does it give any timeline or is there kind of a tipping point? Because we all affect each other here, right? I, I don't hear that it's a moment. You know, I don't hear that. But I do hear that, you know, we're not out of the woods for a while. And that we're having to face all of our creations collectively, including how we treat each other. And they've said four generations is what I've heard. You know, that makes some sense to me. And I think it's important for us all to remember that no soul is left behind. Yeah, I agree. I share with you today one of the declarations in the book of Innocence. You can just sit and be present with the words. On this day, I choose to align any choice and the effect of that choice made in fear to be renowned in the upper room. As I say yes to this, I allow the vibration of the word to reclaim all who are impacted by this choice throughout time. I say these words now in my choice to be free of the effect of past choice that would inhibit my expression as the true self, indeed, in the upper room. I am word through this intention. Word, I am word. I know who I am in truth. I know what I am in truth. I know how I serve in truth. I am free. I am free. I am free. Well, thank you so much for being my guest today, Paul. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Where can we send people who want to know more about your work? It's paulselig.com. You can find out about me on my website, and I do a lot of online you know, workshops, and I'm now traveling again, so I'm, I'm doing public workshops again, and people can find me where I am. And thank you for listening to this week's edition of Exploring the Mystical Side of Life. You will find all of our conversations on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, on iHeartRadio. Come visit me at ThoughtChange.com. Pick up your copy of Learning to Listen. And let's start shifting your energy, too. That's it for this week. We'll see you again next time.